in just so good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this morning's update in pediatrics. Today's presenter is Dr. Otto Music, who is a medical physicist who joined Wayne back in 1993 as a senior physicist in the newly opened Children's Hospital of Michigan Pet Center. He is also in charge of the micro pet slash CT score uh, facility at the Wayne State University School of Medicine. Dr. Music's research includes the development of methods that allow quantitative integration of multimodality neural imaging data obtained from PET, MR, fMRI, and DTI modalities with special focus on the quantitative assessment of fiber tract connectivity between PET and ECOG abnormal brain regions in children with epilepsy. The title of today's presentation is How to Hack Your Physiology to Improve Your Well-Being, a PET and fMRI Study. Thank you very much, Dr. Music. Thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. I always like to listen to it uh, when, <laughs> when people introduce me. So um, what I would like to do, I would like to present you um, our work that uh, investigates regulatory mechanism of the brain, and especially a regulatory mechanism as it relates to relationship between cognitive and autonomic uh, regulation. And uh, so in the essence, the talk about, about how one can influence or, you know, one can say hack a person's physiology to improve mental state and maybe as a result, improve overall well-being. Um, kind of just a background, this work was based on our previous uh, studies investigating brown fat in humans. And I talked about brown fat, you know, extensively in my last talk a year ago, maybe two years ago. Um, you know, as you can remember, brown fat is a thermogenic organ that is activated by cold exposure. And, you know, people believed um, uh, that uh, if one could activate a brown fat for long periods of time, that it might help with weight management. That the NIH was very interested in that because we had all these tools. You know, we kind of started doing it, although we did pediatrics, we did uh, patients with epilepsy, autism, Tourette, and so on. But anyway, um, uh, I did this the, this work which 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 we did with oxygen 15 water and um, alpha methyltryptan from an AGD, you know, demonstrated that brown fat is irrelevant in adults. It's important in in newborns, but not in not in adult oops not adult humans. Um, you know, because subclinical muscle shivering is a much more efficient way to maintain body temperature. However, um. Uh, despite the fact that uh, the brown fat proved to be really irrelevant in adults, in adult humans, it made us aware of, of subjects that are resistant to severe cold and who appear to be able to cognitively or willfully regulate autonomic function. And this is remarkable because autonomic system, as you learn in medical school, is supposed to be autonomic. That means independent from cognitive control. So there is, uh, for example, there is this Dutch national, you can see him, uh, his name is Wim Hof, um, who, who can perform outstanding feats of severe cold resistance. And this is based on a self-developed technique, which we, I will introduce in a second, and he calls it the Wim Hof method. And um, especially because I see um, Tesh there, this is a very, very much based on um, uh, techniques that were practiced by Tibetan and Buddhist monks, monks for, for millennia. So uh, as you can see here, Wim is here in, in, in this, this cold and he can sit there really for hours without really um, getting frostbites or, or um, you know, uh, uh, a decrease in body temperature. And that's the same thing with the Tibetan monks who, who can sit in the cold and dry wet towels on their naked body, which is really amazing. So um, this, 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 this Dutch individual, Wim Hof, he, he holds several world records of being submerged in ice for hours without, again, decrease in temperature or frostbite. He walked up the Kilimanjaro in, in just shorts, you know, so bare chested. And so all this indicates that he can willfully control vasoconstriction because normally you get cold, you know, there is vasoconstriction and, you know, that's it. And you don't have really that much uh, willful control about that. But not only this, uh, he kind of presents this, you know, kind of control of vasoconstriction, kind of a side effect. What he's really uh, driving at 
is that uh, he can control other autonomic function, uh, for example, innate immune response. And, um, and indeed, um, you know, that was in 2012, 2014, a series of paper by Cox et al. These are immunologists from uh, Red Bound University in Nimegen, who showed that uh, profound effects of behavioral intervention, or this Wim Hof method, on immune function. And so this, this uh, Cox et al., they performed two studies, one with Wim Hof in 2012, and then another with uh, volunteers or controls who learned the Wim Hof method in 2014. Um, and they, they applied a experimental endotoxemia paradigm. So essentially the injection of E. coli endotoxin. And the result of these studies were that uh, when these, you know, Wim Hof or these, these volunteers performed this, this method, um, really indeed inflammatory markers like TNF alpha, interleukin 6, interleukin uh, 8, were all decreased and anti-inflammatory markers like interleukin 10 were increased. And they, they concluded from the study that uh, that uh, voluntary suppression of the immune, innate immune response is possible and that is primarily mediated by increased epinephrine release. Um, so what is the Wim Hof method? Uh, the Mo Wim Hof method, uh, as I mentioned, uh, borrows heavily from g meditation, which, be, which has been a uh, Indo-Tibetan tradition for millennia, and which has been used to control body temperature. And this method consists of essentially three activities. Number one, forceful breathing, number two, exposure to cold, and number three, mindful meditation. So the forceful breathing is, you know, there are several rounds of hyperventilation, so about 30 breaths, and then followed by breath retention. And what is really interesting is that when you do this hyperventilation, um, you know, you can hold your breath afterwards for a really long time, you know, two to three minutes. Usually you can do it maybe 20, 30 seconds. The second is exposure to cold. They, they, these people took ice baths for, you know, at least five minutes, maybe longer. And then the kind of the mindful meditation, there are several versions on that, but mostly it's focus on bodily sensations. So awareness of breathing, of cold sensation, which is kind of easy because if you uh, have to breathe uh, voluntarily, you have to focus on breathing. If you're exposed to severe cold, you actually focus on the cold. So there is really not another way to do it. So what, uh, what, how does it relate to what we did? Um, so we were kind of uh, very intrigued about this. Um, and um, we contacted Wim, or somebody suggested to us that we contact Wim and see whether brown fat might play a role in this, this you know, astounding feeds and the resistance of cold exposure. And Wim, of, you know, has a company, it's called Inner Fire. They, they promote this, this method commercially. They are uh, very present on the internet. They have a large following. And he travels all over the world, really promoting, you know, PR, making PR for this, uh, for his method. And he was very eager to come to Detroit. And uh, so we can kind of study him with fMRI and uh, PET imaging. So what we did, we studied Wim's brain with functional MRI and his body with, with a PET CT. Um, so the fMRI, we used the oscillatory cold neutral temperature paradigm, which we used previously, uh, you know, for the brown fat study. And this cold exposure, controlled cold exposure was... Um, was applied using cold water perfusion suit. You, you can see this. This is a method we, we kind of pioneered. Um, the, the where you can uh, apply cold exposure. You, you, you can see here you have these tubes, and the tubes are in a reservoir. It can be a reservoir with you know ice cold sludge and you know the neutral temperature, and then you have pump which pumps the this water through through the suit, and you can kind of measure the skin temperature and determine how how you know how the body reacts. What's the skin temperature? Um, and how then, when you do fMRI, how the brain responds to the to the change in skin temperature. So in addition, uh, we studied uh, the bodily response to cold using PET CT imaging. I'm a, yeah, I come from PET. Uh, using a norepinephrine agonist, um, that's uh, C11 AGD or hydroxyephedrine. And this tracer provides a measure of sympathetic innovation by measuring the activity of the norepinephrine transporter. 
and um, you know how the images look like that activity in tissue of this HED tracer accumulates proportional to the amount of sympathetic innervation, and one can you know semi quantitatively um, determine the the you know what is the sympathetic innervation. So what did we uh, uh, kind of find? So first of all. We quantified sympathetic innovation using this retention index, which you can see here, which is essentially a normalized tissue uptake. You can see here the activity of AGD between the 30 and 40 minutes after injection divided by the integral of the input function. So how much was offered to the tissue and you know, then what is what is the what is the um the response? And um the the uh, basically the results show that um you know, essentially here is here you can see uh, images of the of uh, HED accumulation in the body at rest here on top and at cold at um, a cold stress, and one can see a minimal. Actually, first of all, you can see really unremarkable uptake in brown fat, which is here supraclavicular. Um, so you know, brown fat is probably not uh, you know the reason why he is he has this severe cold resistance. B basically, in contrast, there was increased HED trace uptake in the superior um, uh, intercostal muscles. So, uh, and here is the graph. Unfortunately, here that's <laughs> maybe you can uh, this okay. This is kind of better. Um, so you can see here that um, this is a comparison between the. Uh, a retention index in various tissues. You can see brown adipose tissue, white adipose tissue, intercostal muscle. Uh, in the control group, which is um, uh, uh, in in um, here, these uh, these bars. So in the control group and in VIM, and VIM is this 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 axis here. Um, the the resting retention index is in red and cold stress. Um, Retention index is in blue, and as I, as I said, these are these are the the, the control group, and um, this this is Wim Hof, you know, one one patient, and one can see that actually, really, the brown adipose tissue is very much in the normal range, the same in the white adipose tissue, but there is significant increase in sympathetic innervation in the costal muscle. Okay, let me see. Okay, so um, what is what is was even more interesting was the skin temperature response of Vim during an active phase. So that was a phase when we applied the his method in a passive or resting state. And um, so this is you know kind of the setup for the fMRI data. Um, so the, the 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 graph here shows the uh, oscill oscillating cold neutral exposure paradigm and the skin temperature response in the control group compared to, uh, to, to Wim Hof. Um, so you can see here in, in blue, this is really how, so, so first of all, these are when you apply with this, with this uh, whole body suit, neutral water, so you run blue neutral water, then, and then you uh, uh, ice, uh, ice water, so this is oops, cold cooling, neutral cooling, and so on. So 25 minutes, you know, oscillating uh, paradigm. And you can see here how the skin temperature changes, and we kind of measured skin temperature in the in the fMRI scanner itself. So the gra graph clearly shows that by performing the Wim Hof method, skin temperature uh, resists cold stress challenges stay almost constant for really a long time, for 25 minutes. Um, so again, this suggests that Wim's behavioral method, so this method he applies, allows willful control over vasoconstriction during cold which is supposed to be the autonomic function. And this actually, he can sustain it for, you know, extended period of time. So in this case here for 25 minutes. Um, now this is um, the, the kind of the brain response to, to, to cold. Um, so you can see here on top, uh, this is a Vim in Harper fMRI scanner. And below is again, this, uh, cold neutral activation paradigm. Again, you can see here uh, neutral water, cold water, neutral cold, and you know the, the response of the of the skin temperature. And here are the, the epochs for fMRI imaging. So for fMRI, fMRI shows you um, changes essentially in perfusion 
And um, you are most sensitive if you have a contrast. So you have uh, what happens during cooling, what happens is during warming, you, you generate the contrast. And uh, then you, you, you determine where the contrast is greatest in, in the brain. Um, so the, the analysis showed, and here kind of is the, is the image uh, of the activation, the, that significant differences, you know, we observe significant differences in the periaculate gray, uh, PAG, for the cooling greater warming contrast. And this was between VIM and the control group. So again, this finding suggests that activation of, or the, how we interpreted it, that this suggests activation of the descending pain slash cold pathway in the periaculate gray. Um, you know, kind of a background, the, the periaculate the gray receives input from the periphery via the spinal reticular pathway, and under certain circumstances, releases cannabinoids that activate the descending projection, which affects neurons in the spinal cord, and that this can modulate uh, pain or cold sensation. Uh, this is here a summary of the fMRI results. Uh, we found that activation, in, in, so we find activation both in the periaculate gray and in the in the uh, left anterior insula. And uh, basically, again, what this means, this is a, a significant voxel for the cooling greater of warming contrast between women and the controls. And you can see here on the right, the time series. So this is the time series over the 25 minutes, you know, of, of the, this region, for example, here for the periaculate gray. Um, basically the, 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 the time series for WIM is in red and the time series for the control group is in blue. And one can see significant great activation, both in positive, you know, here positive and negative, uh, direction for Wim during practice of of his of his Wim Hof method as compared to the control groups. So what? So let me summarize the, the the findings and then we can discuss them. So here's a summary of the findings. You know, number one is that um, applying the Wim Hof method, there is still uh, there is a strong activation in the periaculate gray during cold exposure, and. This might, and you know, this was a hypothesis, indicate the activation of stress-induced analgesia. That's number one. Number two is that activation of the left anterior insula, and we know that the, especially the anterior insula is associated with interoception, and the right anterior insula is associated with sympathetic, and the, the le uh, left is parasympathetic stimuli. And again, this kind of might, and it's always in fMRI that you have to interpret the data, this might indicate a better ability to maintain focus during uh, cold stress. Number three, um, the, the forceful respiration, this, this hyperventilation, uh, is might or is increasing the activity on intercostal muscle. And again, this might generate heat that dissipates to the lung tissue and warms the blood. And finally, you know, there is negligible activation of brown adipose tissue. So how can we explain the result? Uh, so what does this all mean? And uh, basically, let, let's, let me put together uh, all this data and try to come up with a coherent story that might explain how this, this method might allow cognitive control over autonomic function. And it's basically, you know, a paper which, which we proposed and which was actually well received. So you know, number one is the, the breathing issue. Um, so if you hyperventilate, this results in hypocapnia. So that means that your CO2, you breathe out too much CO2, which subsequently leads to respiratory alkalosis. Uh, that means your pH value in your blood goes up. So it's less, it's, it's more basic, it's less acidic. Um, so this, this kind of leads to various body sensations. So paresthesis, various body sensations, such as tingling in the fingers, lightheadedness. And the lightheadedness is due to, first of all, vasoconstriction of brain vessels. And also, uh, if you increase um, um, basically pH value, oxygen gets tighter bound to, to hemoglobin. So it's a lower ex oxygen extraction. And that's the reason why, you know, kind of the, the, when people hyperventilate, you know, um, then they tend to faint. Why is this? Because they don't get enough uh, oxygen to the brain. 
Now, so this is the first first step. So you you generate respiratory alkalosis. Now, a breath retention, and now the breath retention is important because it normalizes the CO2 to O2 ratio. It, you stop breathing, so you don't breathe uh, in any oxygen. So oxygen uh, starts accumulating, and you decrease oxygen saturation. And really, this is astounding. And you know, the study was done by Cox that these these people decrease oxygen saturation to less than eighty percent, which you know, in, in normal clinic, this is a disaster. But in this case, because you you had this hyperventilation first, it's okay because you, you really have too much oxygen and uh, in the first place, or the, your, your relation between CO2 and O2 is, is significantly changed. But, you know, once you have a decrease in oxygen saturation, this simulates asphyxia, asphyxia and leads to a general stress response. So the brainstem picks that up, you know, this low oxygen saturation and thinks you are you're suffocating. And now what happens is now you, uh, you know, do the cold, do the cold exposure. So the Basically, the 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 initial um, you know asphyxia uh, primes the system, and the subsequent stress, which is cold in this case, triggers this, the stress-induced analgesia, and this is most likely through through cannabinoid release in the periaqueal vapor grain, and as a result of this, and the cold and pain sensation is decreased. So finally, and this is kind of an important point, which, which is often overlooked, all these changes in your body, so tingling, lightheadedness, cold tolerance, generate an expectation, uh, which leads to a positive prediction bias, a strong belief in the method, which actually turns out to be very important um, to, to prolong whatever happens with, with the physiologic parameters. So, um, so let's let's frame these results in a little bit more general context um, because we really don't want to just kind of understand Wim Hof. We want to understand the general idea how you can really use um, different uh, uh, methods to um, to to influence your your supposedly autonomic uh, uh, nervous system. So there are several points that stand out, um, you know, from from the, from the previous results I presented you. The first one is the contribution of breathing. Second is cannabinoid release, probably you know in the whole brain, but especially in the in the brainstem, and then this positive expectation, which um, you know is in <laughs> normally uh, called placebo effect. The people don't believe it, although it's a real effect. So let's look at each of these contributions. Uh, um, in, in more details. Uh, so first of all, let's look at the breathing. Uh, there, uh, there is recent literature, you can see here this paper from Herrera from 2018, that investigates the role of breathing apart from oxygen delivery to the lungs. Uh, and what, what breathing, vol, uh, vol, volitional breathing does, it synchronizes the local field potential, LFP, with volitional breathing. And, you know, Herrera in you know, co-investigators show that volitional breathing increased the coherence between breathing rate and the local field potential, which has large effects for, for different neural networks because different neural networks are now synchronized. And this uh, happens especially in the interoceptic network, which is uh, anterior insula, um, basically anterior cingulate cortex and insula in general, but most most predominantly anterior insula. So what this paper actually showed, and there are several other papers uh, along the same lines, that volitional breathing increases the alpha frequency component in the local field potential. And we know this, uh, the, the alpha, and this actually happens most prominently in this interoceptive network, as I said, in anterior cingulate and uh, anterior insula. And we know that, you know, if you decrease uh, your, your brain waves, so from beta to, to alpha to theta to delta, it is a calming effect. Uh, so this is probably responsible for the calming effect of volitional breathing. And that's why when you're upset, people say, well, just, just breathe, because you now you're synchronizing uh, uh, kind of the, the breath with your local field potential, and that actually increases the alpha component calms you down. Uh, the, the second part is uh, the, the role of cannabinoids in the, in the whole story. So the cannabinoids, um, uh, especially the cannabinoid type 1 receptor, the CB1 receptor, are widely distributed in the brain 
and act uh, through retrograde signaling. So that means usually the the the, the signal uh, propagates from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic uh, neuron. But here is exactly the opposite, from the postsynaptic to the prosynaptic uh, uh, neuron. And so the, these, these cannabinoid receptors provide a negative feedback mechanism that dampens excess activity by blocking neurotransmitter release in the synaptic cleft. So you can see here, oops, here that uh, on demand, if the, the calcium uh, level increase in the postsynaptic synapse that activates this lipase, DAGL alpha, which uh, splices out um, from, from the bilayer uh, membrane on demand. And, you know, oops, endo, endo, endocannabinoids like 2-AG and andamide, which move them to the presynaptic mem membrane and block uh, release of uh, uh, various neurotransmitters from the, you know, from the vesicles. So as, as a result of this, CB1 receptors modulate neural networks and, and among others, you know, regulate the stress response. And through this, and there's a lot of literature about maintain network homeostasis. So as such, they tend to have an anxiolytic effect because every excess activity is, 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 is decreased. So again, let's look at the literature. Um, you know, there is, there are several several papers which which describe this, and um, you know, so consistent with the negative feedback function, uh, there is this literature that describes the importance in endocannabinoid signaling in maintaining emotional homeostasis, and in addition to many other functions, guarding against fear, uh, anxiety, and stress. So, uh, cannabinoid signaling is a really important part through the negative feedback mechanism. So the final part is the role of expectation. And uh, so the expectation generate positive prediction bias. And this positive prediction bias is, you know, many times called the placebo effect. And uh, this positive expectation bias is essential in order to prolong the effects of both cannabinoid signaling, stress hormone release, like, you know, um, uh, norepinephrine and cortisol, which uh, they, they, these, these effects are relatively short-lived. So, you know, based on our, our studies with thermoregulated mechanism, uh, kind of we developed a relatively sophisticated uh, uh, kind of uh, model and we kind of published this, this framework. And this, this framework describes the interplay between bottom-up and top-down mechanism, which is kind of shown here in this, you know, unfortunately relatively busy slide, um, which uh, contains a lot of, lot of detail. Uh, but what is important here is um, there are just few things which are, which are relevant to, you know, the story I'm, I'm telling here. So uh, first of all, what is the graph all about? You know, on the x-axis, you can see here is the predictive complexity, which is a combination of the time horizon you can predict and the sophistication of this prediction. So how many parameters are, are con considered and how, how sophisticated is, is, is your model? And on the y-axis is predictive hierarchy, which, which describes the anatomical region um, that are involved. And you can see here that, you know, obviously there is, uh, and again, this mantra here is that, you know, the, the brain is a regulatory organ that regulates the body and, and regulates it in two different ways. It regulates it reactively and it regulates it predictively. And both have advantages and disadvantages. Re reactive is that it's here and now, it's happening. The predictive is that you anticipate what's going to happen and then uh, set an action in place in order to preempt, you know, the, the involvement of the, of the reactive system. And both are advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, it's good to be prepared for what's coming, but, um, you know, a prediction is always a prediction. It's a simulation. So who knows if it's going to be true? And that's kind of, you know, and we can go into compliance of patients. Why do patients smoke when you tell them that, you know, the, the consequence is going to go lung cancer? Because they say, well, this is a simulation. And who knows if this is coming true? So, you know, they disregard the simulation and uh, enjoy this here and now, which is, uh, you know, um, regulated by, by the reactive system. Anyway, uh, so how how this this predictive system works is that um, you have on on the higher cognitive level here you have 
uh, expectation. So you have a world model which which makes certain prediction. And but prediction in simulation is only as important as it is that they set an action in motion here and now. So a simulation, which is such a simulation and doesn't follow with a with a action, it's just rumination. It's kind of pointless. The point of a simulation is that you set actually action here now. Um, and so you 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 have have a model. You you uh, set up an expectation, and um, uh, you make a prediction, and then you look for uh, for uh, you know what what is the outcome. And so your sensation and sensation gives you a prediction error, said so that you and then you know you change your 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 prediction. Now. Um, Basically, the, the problem is really this active inference and, you know, we can frame it as motivated reasoning that once you have an expectation, you 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 look for for sensations in, in the environment, which confirms your prediction. So you are selective. You are not objective. You are selective. And that's why, you know, we can have different opinions because we have a different prediction and then uh, we weigh different sensation in a different way. The point here for, for the story I'm telling is that expectation expectation really leads to measurable action at the lower reactive level and that there is active inference, which is the selection of confirmatory information that supports the prediction. And once you have this, what we call active inference, is uh, that neutral or ambiguous sensation and I interpret it as confirmatory information. So you can select from the environment whatever floats your boat, and that becomes then 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 the, the center, and you feel validated. And that's why different people can have different opinions. Okay, so let's see how this um, how this works out. Again, there is uh, ample experimental evidence uh, in literature for uh, the positive uh, positive bias or placebo effect. We know that, for example. Covert treatments uh, are far less effective than overt treatments. So if you give a patient a medication and you don't tell him that you know you gave him medication, it actually doesn't work, work as as well as if you make a big deal out of it. Say, hey, this is a medication; it's very powerful. It's going to be great. And uh, there is clear evidence, for example, in Parkinson's disease, that patients uh, that believe or have strong expectation in, in the efficacy of a, of, of a drug, uh, generate dopamine release in the striatum, although they only got a placebo. So, you know, kind of the take home message is here that doctor reputation and confidence in, in kind of the performance of a doctor in front of a patient, it really affects treatment outcome. It's actually an important component. It's not just the drug, it's how you give it and how you actually make the patient believe that you're really helping him or her. So actually, interestingly, there was, um, you know, there was this, this effect of positive bias on the outcome of behavioral interaction was also noted in the original study by Cox, you know, which was done 2012, 2014, uh, they published a follow-up paper in 2016, which is shown here, uh, which, uh, which showed that both epinephrine release, so epinephrine release, obviously autonomic function, and interleukin 10 release, again, immune function, was correlated with positive bias. So with optimism, as, as, they, as they called it here, optimism, you can see a positive correlation. You know, in addition, you know, outcome expectancy was associated, correlated with outcome expectancy. So the 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 approach of the patient, the belief, the strong belief, the positive bias which he applies to a method is 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 crucially crucially important from for the for the efficacy. So um, so kind of these results confirm that the belief in the method, so the positive expectation bias has a strong influence on neurotransmitter release in brain networks. And this affects then brain function. Okay, so um, so we followed this up with, um, with another study where we actually um, uh, perf uh, took uh, five and then actually we ended up with four young novice healthy males. You know, they were kind of very tight. Um, 25 plus minus 1.4 years. And um, 
uh, you know, perform this, this uh, Wim Hof, taught them Wim Hof method and try to see what's going to happen with the cannabinoid uh, signaling in the brain and with functional MRI. So we did cannabinoid PET CT, both at, uh, uh, at a thermal neutral condition. Um, and uh, we, we, we use the, the FLUOR18 labeled FMPEP2 tracer, which is an inverse CB1 receptor agonist. And again, we use the, this uh, oscillating cold paradigm, which we kind of introduced before. And although we said normal people, we also kind of try to assess within the kind of the normal values, um, you know, whether, you know, some, some indication of depression, which is still in the normal range, uh, it takes place. So we kind of looked, uh, we gave him the Hamilton depression scale. And here you can see kind of the paradigm. So you have the baseline, you do the PET fMRI, you do the cannabinoid PET, the, the, the basically uh, uh, oscillating cold neutral PET fMRI. Then they do this six week training. And that's why we you know, only selected a relatively small number of subjects because it's, you know, it's very difficult to recruit people uh, to make a commitment to such a uh, long study. Um, and then, so they uh, basically, there was an initial instruction, then they did uh, homework, daily breathing culture hours, you know, mindfulness, awareness of their own body. Then every, every Saturday we met again for a few hours, you know, went through the, basically through the diary, if they did it, if there is problems, if they are still motivated and so on. And then uh, after the six weeks, we did again the, uh, uh, you know, PET and fMRI, the, the follow-up scans. So this is just basically the, the, the behavioral intervention. So, you know, we had weekly meetings on Saturdays, two hours. Uh, we, we, we kind of, um, kind of paid uh, a Wim Hof certified instructor which kind of led the groups in this breathing exercise, focused attention and cold exposure. And you can see here, this is kind of how we did the cold exposure. Here is the forceful breathing and meditation. And as I said, you know, the, this, this um, subject had to commit to, you know, exercise, daily exercises of at least 10 minutes, this deep breathing, focused attention in cold showers for at least two minutes. So what did we find out? And actually that was really, you know, very inter interesting. So here you can see this is um, CB1 receptor binding quantified using a volume of distribution. Um, the volume of distribution is essentially the relationship between um, the, the, the activity of the tracer uh, in tissue relative to that of blood at dynamic equilibrium. So you inject the activity, you, you kind of do the scan, you apply compartmental modeling, and you get this, this um, uh, rate constants K1 and K2, which, you know, the ratio K1 and K2 gives you the volume of distribution, which gives you this relationship. So if volume of distribution is 24, for example, that means that uh, at dynamic equilibrium, once every, every, everything equilibrated, you know, there is 24 times more tracer in tissue than in, in, in blood. So you can see here again, these are, these are the four subjects. This is the baseline scan, and this is the follow-up scan. And you can see that in all of the subjects, actually there is there is a mixed response. Uh, some of the subjects uh, were originally rather low, and then through the Wim Hof method actually increased significantly. So this is the binding, you know, or, or cannabinoid signal increased significantly. So in this this Patient, patient number one, it's 45% increased on average. And this other one was 21%. There was 11. And, and this actually was interesting. This person um, was uh, pretty much, he kind of on and off practiced the Wim Hof method before. So it looks like that he already was kind of uh, maxed out in his, in his uh, cannabinoid signaling. But what is also interesting is kind of the, the normal pattern, both a baseline and follow-up, that the, the largest, largest concentration of binding capacity, volume of distribution, uh, of cannabinoid signaling is in the in the caudate slash putamen followed by the cortex, thalamus, and you know non-specific binding in white matter, and this is now you can you know do a lot of uh, image processing. You can um, 
you can uh, now spatially normalize all these images. We had MRI, so we took structural MRI. We, we normalized this to the Telerec Atlas. Then you can apply the same parameters to, to the PET. And then you can kind of average because now they are in standard space. And again, if you look at the parametric images, um, here you can see the, the, the kind of the normalized images, the average over the four patients, post-intervention, pre-intervention. And this is kind of the difference, uh, the post versus pre. We can see that, you know, there are something, you know, in on in, in general, about 20% in, in the in, in the cortex. Um so uh so we, we detected increased um uh, cannabinoid signal, but what was interesting that um you know basically the greatest greatest increase was really in the brainstem in the periaqueal gray and the pons you know these this images previously i kind of picked the 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 cortex but really the pons was was really high what was actually even more interesting is that as i say we we applied the hamilton depression score uh, to this this normal patients and all their depression scores so the, the scale is from zero to like 60 or 70, the higher the value, the more, you know, depressed symptoms you have. And, you know, uh, values between zero and seven are considered normal. It's kind of the, the background. And it was interesting that uh, there was improvement. Improvement in Hamilton D-score, again, is within the, this normal range. And it was it highly correlated with the with the a kind of improvement in cannabinoid signaling. So you can see here that this patient, which is the the forty five percent, had the improvement of three in the in the uh, Hamilton D score. So it kind of correlates that you know you increase the the uh, cannabinoid signaling, and because you know our our theory that is a safe mechanism is a is is a negative feedback is it 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 improves your stress buffering role so now you are uh, less less anxious and less less worried again there was effect uh on in fmri again you can see here these four patients uh the and here are the the epochs so this is the warming epochs cooling epochs again we, we made the contrast between cooling and warming and we can we can again yeah, you know, it's a four patients, so this is really preliminary data, and we need to really write now grants and um, use this preliminary data and, and follow this up with a larger, larger population. But again, we found really in the orbitofrontal cortex, which um, determines context-specific value assignment, and um, in the um, um, really the anterior, you know, insula, which is interoceptive and the that was bilateral. But what was actually even more interesting was the functional connectivity. And, you know, once you have uh, fMRI and you have the, the time series of different regions, what you can do is you can, you can see, you can kind of determine the time series of each region and now see if one region predicts the other region. So, you know, a coherence between the regions. And based on the, the amount of how one region can predict the kind of the, the, the time course of the other region, you can say, oh, well, they are connected. So there is, we call it functional connectivity. And it was interesting that if you set up this matrix, uh, you find um, really a, a relatively high functional connectivity between executive regions, which is here the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and frontal pole, and um, and the insula and subcortical regions. And interest, so you can see here, uh, right posterior insula, right dorsal anterior insula, uh, right anterior insula. But not the left, actually, this was interesting. And that's actually worthwhile to following up why it's the right. And the right, as I say, it's interception is, is related to, to the sympathetic innovation. Um, so this kind of uh, tells us that there probably by the increase in cannabinoid signaling, uh, the, the executive, con executive uh, uh, central executive network is, is a larger uh, effect on, on subcortical, so interoceptive and subcortical region, actually limbic region like the, the amygdala and hippocampus. So uh, again, this is a hypothesis and this needs to be you know, worked out further. Uh, we believe that what it actually shows shows us that on the symbolic level, and again, one can you know 
kind of uh, conceptually describe the brain as in, in a reactive, which is here and now in a predictive part, and in a symbolic and non-symbolic part. So symbolic part is if you if you generate a symbol. So you, you are cold and then you generate a symbol of cold or pain or hunger in kind of which you can then use in a simulation, which is amazing about the symbolic representation, which actually happens in the anterior insula, is that uh, you can, you know, operationally use now the symbol like hunger or pain or cold, although you don't, you are not hungry, you, you don't have pain and you are not cold. So it's com completely separate now from, from, from the perception or the sensation of, of cold. But anyway, so um, basically the silence salience network is mostly this here and now that you have, you know, you feel your body, you, you're aware of your body, you know what's happening. The default mode network is the daydreaming that you kind of go through your, so your episodic memory, what happened yesterday or last year and how this is projected in, in, into the future. And the executive network is 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 you know essentially those lateral prefrontal and the the uh, superior parietal uh, cortex which um, kind of monitors the relationship between all these other networks. So if you kind of you know you, so you catch yourself in 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 daydreaming, say oh what I'm doing yeah I'm daydreaming. That's the executive network which the thing because before you were in the default mode network. And uh, so what we believe is that um, this, 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 um, this uh, kind of frequent switching or improving in cannabinoid signaling uh, lets you get away from the formal network, from, from this, from this uh, projection, the simulation that bad things are going to happen and people get uh, riled up about, you know, bad things going on, that you can switch back to the salience network. So you prevent a runaway mode. So... Kind of the, the the bottom line, uh, second to last slide. What does the how can we explain Wim Hof method or any other of these behavioral intervention methods, which um, which kind of people promote? You know, there's a lot of you know mindfulness and meditation and here and that. It's based on controlled stress and uh, and mindfulness. So, if you perform controlled stress and um, uh, we call it hormetic stress which is controlled stress. So it can be cold, it can be fasting, intermittent fasting, can be exercise, it can be hot, it can be sauna. So what does it mean? It uh, focuses the body on this here and now. You are cold, you are hot, you, you feel pain, you exercise, you need to vo uh, volitional breathing. You have to focus on the here and now. There is no way that you can be in the default mode network because that's not the time to you know uh, worry about what's happened. You are worried about here and now. And um, so... You, you kind of exercise the switch between the default mode network and the salience network, so being a here and now. And um, it, it improves also, and this is associated with, with it's an increase in cannabinoid signaling, so this, this negative feedback, which gives you, and again, you, you disconnect from, from a worrisome prediction, gives you a better mental state. That's on one side. The, the other side is, uh, you know, improvement in physiological recovery. So if you expose your body to control stress uh, uh, frequently, your sympathetic nervous system or your recovery system becomes better and better to you know, recovery. That's basically what, what exercise is all about. You know, at the beginning, you, 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 you kind of exercise and you, you are sore because there is, you know, muscle damage and it can get rebuilt. And after you do this for a while, you don't feel it because your recovery mechanism becomes more and more efficient. So now, so what you have is a better mental state in a better physical state. Now that actually improves belief in, in the method, which now leads to positive experimentation, so a positive bias. So, and now we're going into this business of placebo effect, the active inference that now that you believe, okay, this, this really works, this is great, I'm getting better mentally and physically, you adopt an optimistic interpretation. So ambiguous signal, which usually you would discard, say, no, no, this is exactly telling me that I'm doing better now. So the summary, and you can see here, this is Wim Hof smiling, you know, the, the giving you the the kind of the the, the uh, uh, better way to to life. That really this hacking or the influence uh, of autonomic brain system is possible, 
And this is possible using combination of controlled stress, so hormetic stress, and awareness of your body, or we can call it mindfulness. And this actually is really important because you can assert control over key components of brain system that reg uh, they are related to immune system and also to networks that regulate mood and anxiety. So in essence, you know, we all should, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, think of 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 using these uh these um this behavioral intervention so thank you very much that's kind of my talk and um let me actually put this back on here uh i hope you you found this interesting <laughs> tesh tesh you know we should go to an ashram in india and practice this right yes yeah. well, well finally i think i i learned uh you know what keeps you happy i, I think uh you no, no i i actually i i do this i i do cold showers i do sauna i exercise you know yeah. i try to you know eat eating i mean it it really kind of works well but you know can, really the message is of 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 this thing that this is not really a, a mystique or mysterious thing. It's it's really anybody can do that. And this is kind of just um, kind of providing the scientific rationale why, you know, and, you know, I, I don't need to tell you, you know, in, in India, people do this for a long time, but it's kind of more a religious experience and it's kind of philosophical. Here it's really, it's, it's just science. It's just medicine. It's just, you know, a regulatory mechanism in the brain. That's actually how it works, positive bias, belief, and so on. So I think this is a, I think it's a important contribution to, to society, you know, so. Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions. One, yeah. this hyperventilation, does it start the same time as you lower the temperature or you do it before you lower the No, volume? no, basically you do this uh, first. So you, this kind of a setup, so you, you get prepared. And once you kind of are in this already st uh, state where already you're in a stress situation, you know, so you did the hyperventilation and the breath retention. So you're already kind of... You know, your oxygen uh, saturation is like 70%, 75%. So you are, and then you do the cold exposure, actually. So they do this before, and then they do the the, the cold paradigm. Mm -hmm. And then you, know, you, you you elaborated on the importance of uh, cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, any role for exogenous cannabinoids in any of this? Well, the cannabinoids, really the cannabinoids... It's kind of interesting because you see what we expected is that we just uh, we just see some. So originally we believed it's this distress induced analgesia. So there was kind of hypothesis, and we kind of thought that we just gonna see something in the brainstem. And then what we found is really the the general increase in the whole brain. And you know, so now you need to interpret it, and you know, interpretation. And again, it's you know, this is science and. This, this continues this this story, but it looks like it's um, you know cannabinoid signaling. It's this this negative feedback. So cannabinoids are really that's why when you take uh, marijuana or THC, you are kind of stoned. What, what does it mean? It slows everything down. So it still slows down how you move and it slows down how you think. And when you are slow in thinking, you are probably not at worried. So you are kind of laid back. So uh, and you know. But really what is interesting, so this is the interesting part that, um, you know, and I kind of didn't mention it. So if you use uh, cannabinoids, like recreationally, it actually decreases your cannabinoid signaling. So there's a lot of papers that if you take, really it was interesting, all the drugs, alcohol, nicotine, and THC, that instead of an increase, you get a decrease, and which actually makes sense because you, you kind of have too much cannabinoids in your system and, you know, your adaptive system, uh, decreases now the receptors because oh there are too many too too much too much um, uh, suppression so we don't need that many cannabinoid receptors so the the message really is that you know, THC is actually a bad bad way to to increase your cannabinoid signaling and what what you really want to do is really this this controlled stress the hormonic stress and kind of challenge your body and kind of believe and and, and so on so so um this is kind of what I say the most important insight that you cannot actually trick the system by, by through drugs. You have to really do this, uh, you know, behavioral intervention. Thank you. Looks mm -hmm. like Graham has a question. Mm -hmm. Graham, yes. 
Yeah, I, I've, I've done the Winhof method. It's, it's very interesting. It definitely has some advantages. I actually found that I was actually holding my breath too long. I started to get very concerned I was going to pass out. But hmm. um, th these sort of these sort of studies that you do are very complicated to do. And there's always mm -hmm. going to be a charge that what you're coming up with is like a just so story. We found this part and this part of the brain, and therefore that explains yeah. what we're seeing here. Um, and you, you cited a lot of papers from like 30 years ago. Is anybody doing any animal work to try and recreate any of these effects? Well, animal work is problematic in, in, in this kind of, I mean, uh, you know, I don't, you know, so my personal opinion is that you have to really do this in humans, that um, animal work is is not very useful. I mean, yeah, basically, it's in my experience from, from brown fat, that brown fat is essential in, in rodents. It's it's irrelevant in adults because it's very different. You know, a, a small rodent has very different, uh, you know, body surface to to volume relationship than the human and the same thing i think applies in to psychological you know a, the psychology of a human are very different than psychology or the, the brain networks than uh of a rodent so i personally think that if you want to kind of get ahead and understand this better you have to really do the studies in in humans mm. Any other questions for Dr. Music? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is uh, Ashok Sarnaik. Uh, mm -hmm. Otto, that was, uh, that was brilliant, a uh, brilliant piece of work. Thank you very much. Uh, my, my question uh, is uh, uh, regarding the hyperventilation again. Mm -hmm. And uh, the so-called breath-holding breakpoint is mm -hmm. uh, when you uh, uh, voluntarily hold your breath, Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, cannot uh, hold your breath for too long uh, because your CO2 level, PCO2 uh, rises and mm -hmm. uh, it stimulates respiration. So you start breathing before you get uh, hypoxic. Now, uh, when you have a preceding hyperventilation, mm -hmm. you have brought your PCO2 down so much and then you practice your uh, breath holding breaking point you you last much longer because mm -hmm. it takes a while yeah. for the PCO2 to build up and stimulate your respiration so this kind of a practice uh, was uh, was uh, was observed in uh, underwater swimming mm -hmm. uh, underwater swimmers uh, who could hold their breath underwater for much longer if they hyperventilated mm -hmm. first. However, uh, there were several instances where the swimmers, even the expert swimmers, they uh, uh, underwater, they just uh, lose their consciousness mm -hmm. and uh, they actually uh, can uh, uh, die of mm -hmm. uh, uh, hypoxia because uh, this is simply because their PCO2 doesn't rise uh, enough uh, mm. and they get uh, unconscious because of hypoxia. Now, this Winoff method and hyperventilation, uh, that is uh, uh, in a uh, observed situation. But if someone practices this, uh, isn't there some kind of a risk of uh, having mm -hmm. apnea? Actually, there is there is definitely a risk. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you see this uh, Wim Hof was criticized from, from a lot of people that, you know, it's unsafe. And he always said, well, you need to kind of um, first learn it from, from an instructor or from myself. And, you know, once you kind of do it, uh, you know, many times, I guess you become better in that and you can kind of judge it better. But definitely, actually, there were some some instances where, where people kind of was was a was a close call. So but, you know, you know, people I mean, I'm sure this is kind of this breath and it's kind of interesting with with breathing because breathing has so it has a lot of other 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 purposes. In, in a human than just getting oxygen into the lungs, you know, the, this kind of coherence of the networks plus the 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 
kind of focusing. If you so when you breathe, you have to evolutional breathing. You have to focus on your body, and that's actually kind of disconnects you from from rumination. And um, I think that uh, so yeah, it is. It it has some risks, but uh, you know you kind of. I think it's a it's a useful method, and that's why all meditation practices are using some form of breathing. I mean, you know, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's actually yeah. kind of they. I, I'm sure that in ashrams and and thing they do exactly yeah, yeah. The same thing, different variations. Hmm? I I just wanted to uh, put a little caution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, that this is just brilliant. I just have one more question mm -hmm. because. Uh, you know, it has been uh, sort of uh, commented on and mm -hmm. the uh, yoga, uh, yogics mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, uh, in India, uh, there is a difference between hyperventilation through intercostal muscles involvement mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. uh, hyperventilation from a pure uh, diaphragmatic Yes, uh, yes. Uh, movement uh, where you uh, leave your uh, chest wall mm. uh, fairly relaxed and what you are hyperventilating with mm. is more through your diaphragm and it's, uh, it's said, I don't know, uh, perhaps you could mm -hmm. look into this uh, mm -hmm. with your uh, MRI uh, studies. Uh, the the diaphragmatic hyperventilation produces much more calming uh, mm -hmm. influence, whereas intercostal hyperventilation is more uh, stress uh, provoking. And this sort of has a basis uh, of how the fetus, uh, uh, because uh, in utero, uh, the, the fetus doesn't use much of uh, the the intercostals uh, mm -hmm. most of the fetal breathing is with the diaphragm and there is some uh, difference between uh, diaphragmatic uh, uh, ventilation versus intercostal ventilation uh, in terms of uh, endorphin release and and mm -hmm. uh, 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 feeling of calmness is there no. uh, have you come no, no. Across? basically you you make an excellent point yeah i mean i completely agree and you know this was more a methodological issue that because we <laughs> you see our our axial field of view it's only 16 centimeters so we actually put it on the left ventricle for reasons to get the input function so we actually didn't have the data for for the diaphragm so maybe we you know we could Maybe, I mean, I'm yeah. You're absolutely right that there are different breathing breathing uh, kind of techniques, and most of them actually don't use the intercostal. Most of them they different. We did yes. not have this data, so that's kind of a limitation of of our study. But I think that your point is well taken, and we need kind we need to revisit this with you know the different form of breathing. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with you. Thanks, that's brilliant, brilliant work. Thank you so much. Please, La Ravi. Uh, hi, Arthur. That was great. Hey, Ravi. Can... Yes, yes. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that was very interesting. I came a couple of minutes. Uh, one minute, I think I came into your fourth slide. But yeah. anyway, uh, I got the picture. So I was going to ask you uh, your comments about the relationship with innate immune response mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, did you do any measurements and um, of any cytokines or actually changes in monocyte populations uh, with the uh, uh, before and after uh, this type of intervention? Yeah, yeah, we we actually did not do that. I, I, you know, basically um, the we kind of relied on the immunologists or we relied on the paper from, from Cox. And, you know, basically he, they looked at a lot of cytokines and they thought that the, the biggest difference was this interleukin 6, 8, 10, and, you know, TNF alpha and epinephrine increase. But uh, really it's kind of, you know, the whole story with this 
suppression of immune response. And actually people ask me this, you know, in COVID, it's like, oh, it's Wim Hof really, you know, he showed that we have, uh, we, you can suppress the immune system. And, you know, my answer was, and this is actually how I understand it, that if you have autoimmune disease where your immune system is overreactive, yeah, by any means, this is a good way. If you have, uh, you know, infection, bacterial infection or whatever we have, that's probably not a good because you don't want to suppress your immune system. So, so that's kind of also a little bit misleading uh, with the that really you know what what Cox what was shown that although you can suppress your immune response, which is sometimes useful again you know rheumatoid arthritis or whatever, but in general case you want your immune system to work in fine. So it would be much more interesting to increase your, your immune response to make it extra stronger instead of suppressing it. So again, it's, it's kind of in general is 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 the issue that you know. There, there are ways of cognitively affecting um, autonomic function. And now, you know, you need to be smart about it, how you do this. So that's kind of the, the, the kind of the general point. But to your, to your specific question, we have not done any cytokines or, or in, looked at interlooking. We, we're just imaging people. We just image fMRI and PET. That's what we do. Do, do you do any blood collection for measurements of some isotope or anything? No, no, we did, but it's just, we will just look at radioactivity in blood. So for example, the retention index, you kind <clears> of <throat> look at the integral under the curve, but it's just plain radioactivity. We don't do any metabolites or anything. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's really good questions, you know, especially the breathing with the intercostal. Actually, if, if, you're, collect, if you're collecting blood anyway, uh, if you archive the plasma, uh, you can do cytokine measurements uh, later in a batch. Mm -hmm. So it, it's relatively easy to do. Hmm. Uh, but you have to archive the uh, uh, plasma. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, we can help, I mean, we can yeah. Help you. so basically, so, you know, so this is, you know, so no, from brown fat to do Wim Hof to see if he was brown fat to now to this patient. Again, you know, the problem is that these are relatively, uh, you know, not easy to do study. You know, it's a lot of commitment. You have to select the patients. You don't want to kind of invest a lot of, lot of time and effort. And then people say, well, I kind of, you know drop out there is also there are also publications that um that cannabinoid signaling is actually different in females and males there is one paper about that so that's why we kind of concentrated only in males now so really the, the future of this whole enterprise is that we have now really good um preliminary data and maybe we can we can make you know nih or whoever excited about this and say hey you know why don't you fund a larger study and then we kind of you know we we kind of maybe gonna do then you know some some uh cytokines and we need to think about this more deeply but this was actually really a a kind of follow up on this Wim Hof you know what happens with cannabinoids and as I said we expect it just in the brain stem. we didn't expect that the whole brain that's actually why you do a scan it's like why is that so so anyway and uh, basically um you know I see from Herman uh, the the kind of a question speculate on possible practical application of what we learned so far so essentially you know straight up I, I think that everybody should, uh, to a certain extent, do this. So everybody should expose themselves to, you know, intermittent stress or controlled stress, and everybody should do some sort of, you know, kind of awareness of of a body. It's 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 time well spent, and it's kind of you know, so exercise, intermittent fasting, you know, cold showers, you know, it, it, it's it actually really improves improves your physiology, improves your you know, recovery mechanism, your sympathetic system, and you kind of improves your 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 mental capacity. So I would absolutely recommend it to everybody to at least kind of do rudimentary uh, things like that or think how you, they can implement it into the daily routine. Otto, one, one more thing. You, you showed a difference uh, 
mm-hmm. that there was a, a activity in the on the right side but not mm-hmm. on the left side yes does uh, does handedness uh, make any difference yeah uh, do you, did you have all uh, right handed uh, people in your or did, did you so, see some people left handed may uh, behave differently so in in our case they were all right handed that's the yeah. i don't yeah. so but you see the, the the point i really try to make is that we don't believe then that handedness has any role so Basically, there there are and actually um, there, there are you know a lot of publication about that which which assert that the the right insula is is uh, interception of the sympathetic or are associated with sympathetic so so stress cold thing and and the left side is a parasympathetic so we're not sure that handiness has anything to do with it it's more about sympathetic versus super you know a a this is a opponent component system, as they call it. The, these two, these two parts of the of of the of the insula. So, but you know, we had only four patients, so it's kind of you know likelihood that they were all right handed and they were all right handed. But if you have a larger larger group, that might be different. And um, not sure, you know, we need to think about this. What what we're gonna do it moving forward? Okay. Any other questions? Everybody, everybody be, should be should be doing some form of this this behavioral intervention. It's it's really beneficial. And actually, <clears throat> I think what is what is even more important in you know for for pediatrics is <clears throat> I think that <clears throat> that uh, positive positive bias or expectation not important. So you know it really kind of this this active inference is is really important that if you perform for the patients if you tell them this is a really powerful and you know impress the patient you know the the effect is much better than <clears throat> if the patient kind of you know is on the on the fence about this so uh you know kind of performance of of the doctor in front of the patient and kind of convince him and in in Kind of generating strong belief in that this is going to really help him. It's it's very essential for for you know for for the business at hand. So you know because people always say oh, you know this is kind of a psychological mumbo jumbo and you know doesn't doesn't mean anything. It's it's really important and and really I think that what is important that you know simulation or prediction are really really have really effect they have really measurable effects and for a good reason because if you have a prediction and doesn't actually lead into any actions or release of of neurotransmitters at at here and now the whole point it's it's kind of useless why would evolution start this if if it doesn't have any effect on on the lower lower levels so it actually makes perfect sense why and you know americans are all about positive thinking is it's it's really a good way to to kind of um affect your 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 physiology thank you so much dr music and thank you for presenting today thank you very much thank you for for all all for for people who gave really good questions so you know, I'll I'll maybe in a year when we have more data and hopefully get some money to do some larger studies, I can update you on what what happened next. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, and thanks for everyone for attending. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Uh, stop share. Oops, sorry. Okay, here we go. Okay. Thank you. Bye.